I was an undergraduate here. I lasted only one, one year and one month for a variety of reasons. Uh, but it's a pleasure to uh, introduce today's uh, plenary speaker, Professor Adi Jadbhavai. Um, you mentioned you had a long list. I have a long list here of things to talk about. <laughs> he got his PhD from a small college in Los Angeles called California Institute of Technology. He first stopped in Yale with Professor Steve Morse. He is uh, currently a, a distinguished endowed professor associated with the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at MIT. He also directs the Socio-Technical Systems Research Center and is an associate director of Institute of Data Systems and Society. Before joining MIT, he was uh, an endowed professor also at uh, uh, UPenn. Now, uh, he's got his basket full of awards, so he is a fellow of the IEEE. He's got the prestigious uh, uh, Early Career NSF Award. Uh, also the ONR Young Investigator Award. He's got a couple of best paper awards. Uh, one for, I guess it must have been for ACC. And the second for the transactions of automatic control, the IEEE transactions of automatic control. And also, he's a Vannevar Bush Fellow, uh, which is like, I don't know how many of you know of something called the MacArthur Fellow, which is given to uh, some genius or a group of people who are determined, who have been determined to be genius uh, by uh, MacArthur Foundation. This one is administered by the Office of the United States Secretary of Defense. Um, so, uh, he's also editor-in-chief, in fact, the founding editor-in-chief of Transactions on Network Sciences and Engineering, and an Associate Editor of Informs Journal of Operations Research. So, for his description of his research work, he works with the interplay between dynamical systems and networks. Okay? The work of his that I am the most familiar with, and which I regard to be exceptionally influential, is his work on flocking or multi-agent systems. One of his early papers, while I think he was still a postdoctoral fellow, uh, which considered uh, the stability of something called the Vixec model, which says how do, let's say, birds traveling at the same speed, how do they steer each other so that they acquire the same direction while um, only talking to their neighbors, okay? So, again, got a very distinguished record, which I've just talked about. So, uh, he's going to talk today about collective behavior in socio-economic systems, okay? So, please welcome Professor Jatmapa. Hey, uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here uh, speaking today. Um, it's uh, great to be back to India after 20-something years. Um, and uh, I wanted to share with you some of the work that has been going on in my group uh, with uh, my students, colleagues, and postdocs over the past uh, roughly 15 years on a uh, study of uh, collective behavior in social engineering and uh, economic systems. Um, this work has uh, been lucky to receive uh, support from a variety of agencies. Um, and uh, so I will give you a sort of a brief overview of things that have been going on in my group. So as you heard earlier, uh, I uh, started my um, academic work after my PhD uh, in studying collective behavior in, uh, in natural systems. I got interested in uh, understanding how um, 
groups of uh, different species uh, coordinate their motion to move uh, as a group uh, together and that led me to uh, studying the motion coordination and plotting. Uh, the past uh, seven, eight years, my interests have somewhat shifted to studying similar types of questions in the context of uh, social systems. Um, the first group has led to some results on uh, plotting motion coordination, formation control, uh, synchronization, uh, consensus algorithms for distributed optimization, and coverage methods for mobile sensing networks. Um, the second uh, type of results has led to understanding things like collective action, uh, collective coordination in, in, in uh, social groups, uh, a concept called social learning, which I will spend a lot of time on to define uh, about how groups uh, exchange opinions with each other and how they uh, combine their uh, own observations and experiences with that of their social peers. Uh, I've also worked on things related to contagion and spreading processes, uh, but, uh, and also understanding of cascades, social cascades and systemic risk in, uh, in uh, social systems. So unfortunately, I wouldn't have time to talk about those, but I'm happy to uh, uh, sort of follow up on discussing these things uh, offline with any of you. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, the tools that you'll hear about in, in my talk, and it's sort of been the focus of my research really, is sort of combining ideas from the science of networks with uh, decision theory, dynamical systems, and I've been applying this to a variety of domains, uh, as you see that down here. <clears throat> so um, the work that we've been doing on uh, collective behavior and swarming has sort of uh, uh, been applied to a variety of directions, some of it by me and my colleagues and some of it by uh, other people in the community. A lot of different communities have been focusing on different aspects of these questions. Um, <clears throat> so early on, we uh, uh, were interested in understanding uh, uh, schooling and flocking behavior in, uh, in, in fish and birds. And the idea was to get motivation and understanding of uh, mechanisms of how uh, distributed coordination can happen when agents talk to each other and sense only their local neighborhoods. Uh, that led to uh, things like formation control of robots. Uh, we've been also using similar ideas and algorithms for developing coverage mechanisms. I've had a postdoc uh, who's now faculty at uh, Stevens Institute of Technology on uh, studying you know, tune tuning and formation control. We've done work on wireless sensor networks, resource allocation in networks, and uh, optimizing flows, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, so uh, when I started uh, uh, my postdoc uh, with uh, Professor Steve Morse at Yale, um, our community was starting to get interested in, in understanding uh, control and dynamical systems beyond uh, single agents. So uh, my work started by actually an NSF-funded project um, that involved uh, it was a multidisciplinary team that involved uh, Steve Morris, Naomi Leonard, and uh, uh, Julia Parrish, who was a um, evolutionary biologist at the University of Washington. And the idea was to see how, what we can learn from uh, collective behavior and understanding of the ecology of uh, group behavior in animals and how we can sort of study that for uh, other man-made and human systems. And in doing this work, um, I, we got interested in uh, the work that was done in, in two very disparate communities. And this is how interesting how different groups of people uh, come into similar ideas from uh, very, very different backgrounds. The first was a um, paper from SIGGRAPH, which is the premier computer graphics conference from 1980s, by a fellow named Craig Reynolds, uh, who uh, created uh, basically animations for, uh, for cartoons. His work has been in many Hollywood movies. Uh, so if you see uh, like stampede scene where you know groups of uh, uh, you know lions are you know herding together or birds flocking, chances are it's some variants of uh, Reynolds' algorithm. Um, 
And then we found this other paper from mid-90s, which kind of was analyzing uh, a somewhat similar model, totally independent. They, uh, you know, they had not heard of the earlier work by Thomas Vitek, uh, who's a statistical physicist at, and his colleagues at, uh, in, in Hungary. And their idea was to sort of model the motion of uh, groups as uh, what they called self-propelled particles, which could um, uh, basically adjust the, the direction of their motion by aggregating where they're going with, with that of their neighbors. And they were interested in a simulation study of what, how um, basically this group behavior emerges, or in the physicist's language, um, a symmetry breaks and a preferred direction of motion gets realized, even though they start from sort of random initial conditions, and even though their motion is subject to this. Um, and then as we was, uh, as I was sort of investigating this literature, I realized that this has received quite a bit of attention also in the popular science literature. Later on, uh, there was this book, the interesting book by Steve Strogatz on the science of synchronization, and of course, uh, our results and many other people's work relate to that. There was a work related to crowd control, which is, you know, many of you know, it's, it's an important topic. Uh, uh, as you know, every time you get large collections of people, uh, and you want to make sure you know you want to make sure a stampede does not happen, how do you ensure that people, by coordinating with uh, those around them, uh, end up uh, doing the correct motion? And of course, as we talked about, there's uh, many articles on how birds uh, uh, here. But as of the time that we started this research, we realized that a lot of the work. In, in this area is mostly descriptive, simulation-based um, uh, behavioral models, some of the mathematical models, but mostly simulation-based. And we, you know, as a systems theorist, you know, we found that these results are not very satisfying. So we tried to sort of find the simplest real model that uh, we could think of based on uh, the, the model and try to ask these questions. Like how does collective behavior emerge? How can we control it? How can design it, and then we realize that this is actually understanding these things is key to uh, understanding distributed uh, control and decision making generally in, in that sense. Um, so <coughs> this model of Vichek, as was uh, mentioned earlier, was, was rather deceptively quite simple. The idea is that you know you have a, a group of self-propelled particles, we could think of them as kinematic robots moving in a plane. Um, so there's no inertia, um, they're moving with constant speed, and they're just aligning the direction of the velocity vector. And uh, HX algorithm was actually quite intuitive. It said, you know, any agent will look at some specified neighborhood. You could think of this as the neighborhood of influence, or they're sensing or communicating. This is the range at which they could reliably communicate. And then, in this neighborhood, they would average the, their angle, or the uh, heading, uh, with, with that of their neighbors, and then they take one step. Um, so the angle is, you could think of it as the, the angle of their velocity vector, and the uh, equation, if I were to write it down, would say that, you know, this angle, as I updated over time, has to be essentially the average of the angles uh, with, with that of their neighbors, specifically that you would do the arc tangent of some of the sines over the neighborhood and some of the cosines, and I want you to notice that uh, this is actually uh, here. These things change over time because, as every time you have a different set of neighbors, as as you, as you move on. And so we started by analyzing a linearized version of this model, um, where every time you repeatedly average your, your directional motion, it turns out actually there's a uh, more sophisticated linearization technique by change of variables that is more than just small angle can write this thing as a weighted average. Uh, so as I said, the difficulty was that you know, motion changes the network because the network is based on proximity. As you move on, the proximity changes. Given the fact that you had a connected network early on, doesn't ensure that it just stays connected. And then we had this paper that was mentioned earlier, where roughly speaking, um, it uh, said that if uh, some form of connectivity is persists over time in this network, 
then information is diffused from every node to every other, and eventually they all agree in, in a in the direction of motion. And this was somewhat surprising to us that this condition is somewhat a weak, rather weak notion of connectivity, where all that is required is that over time, the graph that is realized as connected is connected and this connectivity persists over time. So we came up with this notion of connectivity over time, which basically says, you know, if you superimpose these graphs on top of each other, you end up getting a, um, a connected graph. And you just have that. So this basically, we got lucky, this received uh, a lot of attention in the literature. There are tons and uh, tons of variants and uh, different ways of doing this. Uh, there's also connections to uh, newer and, and older stuff. Turns out there's a large literature in statistics and in uh, distributed computing um, that, that sort of utilizes similar ideas. Um, and this has also led into development of new algorithms for uh, computing things in a distributed way across the network, even if you don't want to just uh, coordinate uh, motion. But every time you want to compute anything in a distributed way, it turns out knowing how to get people to agree in a distributed way is, is a useful subroutine for, for doing that. And this has received applications, in, as I said, in optimization, and statistics and inference, and control, robotic signal processing, and as we'll see in a bit, in opinion dynamics, social networks, and so-called gossip algorithms, where, uh, in which the graph that is realized every time is just a one edge at any time that you pick a neighbor and then you communicate information with, with only that. There's also a different direction um, that in some ways can be interpreted as a continuous version of the model, a continuous time version of the model that I discussed that goes back to uh, a uh, very well-known model in, in physics called the Kuramoto model of coupled uh, oscillators. Um, so instead of thinking of this data as the angle of a uh, heading of, of a bird or a robot, uh, now I want you to think of this as the phase of an oscillator. And so suppose you have a bunch of uh, oscillators uh, oscillating at some frequency omega i, and uh, in a distributed way, you want to synchronize uh, these oscillators together. So imagine we're sitting in a concert hall, uh, the concert ends, and then someone starts to clap. And uh, then you hear the frequency at which people around you clap. And then you try to adjust how you clap uh, to sort of phase lock with, with those that are around you. So if they, um, the, the term here, you can interpret it as, as a controller that, that tries to regulate uh, the, the phase of this. So this has studied a lot of attention in the case where the network is all to all in the physics literature. We analyze this model in, in, in the case of arbitrary graphs and try to figure out what are conditions for um, reaching the frequency loss in phase synchronization. We've also done analysis of um, this model when subject to delays. Uh, Nikhil sitting here has also done uh, a lot of work on this. And of course, this is, uh, turns out that you could think of these as sort of a kinematic version of swing equations governing the power grid. So if you add an inertia to this model, then you would have a fairly uh, good model of how uh, uh, you can model the dynamics of the grid. There's also many other things like the Mexican waves in, in, in soccer. As you see, you know, people start standing up and then, uh, you know, this sort of wave propagates. Rhythmic applause, pacemaker cells, and neurons are and then typically, the kind of questions you ask in this domain is, what is the effect of the network structure on how fast things synchronize? Uh, how far these initial fre uh, uh, frequencies have to be for phase synchronization to happen? What are the effects of delays? What is the onset of synchronization? And what happens when you make the, the number of oscillating variables? But I want to spend the rest of the talk on sort of more recent things that have been going on uh, the past few years. Uh, through the influence of some of my students, I got more interested in collective behavior in uh, things that involve people. Um, of course, these are uh, much more complicated to study. Um, but I, you know, felt like you know the uh, these issues are somewhat more impactful, even if, if not less. And so, uh, turned out that there is a large 
uh, literature in a variety of different communities uh, that speak different languages um, that uh, are interested in studying things uh, of this sort. So understanding how financial cascades occur. You know, we've seen this uh, happening in uh, around the world. You know that how uh, sort of uh, bankruptcies and you know, financial issues in, in uh, Greece propagates to the rest of the European Union. We've seen social cascades happening with the emergence of the Arab Spring, uh, the housing bubble, uh, you know, spreading of the epidemics and bank runs. And these are the cases where you want to stop the epidemic. So we've worked on uh, how you exploit the network, network structure to allocate scarce resources to stop epidemics and also to maximize epidemics when that is more fruitful. So if you want to do viral marketing, how would you price products to over time to make sure that their spreading is, is sort of maximized? But um, the thing that I um, uh, want to sort of emphasize in all of these, there's an underlying dynamics that is run over a network. Um, and then we want to uh, uh, sort of study some global behavior from, from these local interactions. So the, at the macroscopic level, the type of questions that we want to ask are similar to the questions that we were asking earlier, but the, some of the tools that methodology can be different. So the topic that has uh, basically taken a lot of my attention the past few years is sort of uh, in the same realm, um, and it's in the context of a uh, economists and uh, social psychologists called uh, social learning. In our language, we could interpret that as, you know, a form of distributed estimation detection or, or inference. And the fundamental question that, you know, is uh, people in various social sciences have been asking over the past 50, 60 years is the following, that if you want, how do people in groups make decisions? Uh, in other words, you know, these groups could be deliberative bodies, it could be um, in committees, it could be in organizations, it could be in juries. Uh, you know, people come in with uh, predisposed opinions, they make their own observations, uh, and then they exchange their beliefs and opinions instead of their observations. And uh, you would like to collectively, the, the goal of the group is to cooperate, to collectively uh, learn an un the so-called underlying state of the world. This could be an unknown quantity that they, or decision that they want to reach to. And this decision is something that is relevant to uh, their utility or their payoff. Uh, an example of that could be, you know, as a group, we want to decide what restaurant to go to. Uh, you know, we look at reviews, different people have different experiences. Uh, you know, I might not share with you all the things that I've learned about the restaurants in the city, but I might share with you my opinion of which restaurant I think is better than the other. Um, so we want to make decisions in groups. How do we ensure, uh, what are the underlying mechanisms for decisions to have good results and learning happening? And when does learning fail? And what are the uh, underlying pathologies that can occur in such a more on the engineering side, you could think of this as uh, a problem of inference or detection or sensing. You have a spatially distributed network. They all make different measurements. These sensors might be heterogeneous. You know, they have different resolutions. Um, they don't communicate their operations because they might be sensing different things. But they might communicate their belief about which one of the states they're in. And so the underlying mechanism or question we want to study is uh, uh, basically how should uh, the private observations and opinion of others in the network that I have access to be uh, uh, sort of uh, fused together, what is the right way of aggregating these together, and what is the effect of the network, and, and so forth. And so um, this is, as I said, you know, called social learning in other communities, sometimes it's called also opinion pooling, uh, which is, again, the central question is combining private operations and peers. Who do you want to vote for, whether Republican or Democrat uh, uh, in, in, in US politics? Uh, you have observations. You uh, 
uh, communicate your beliefs to others. Um, you read reviews. You want to understand which places you want to uh, you want to go to. Um, or uh, you know there are beliefs spreading in the society that, for example, that uh, vaccines cause autism. Uh, how do things like these spread? Uh, despite the fact that um, in uh, collectively as a network we know, for example, that this is uh, this is not uh, not true. Or another question is, you know, we see evidence of climate change around us. Uh, this is a big issue in the U.S. where uh, you could think of this as an inference problem with three states, where you know one state is climate change is real, the other one is climate change is fake, uh, the third one is climate change is real but uh, not man-made. If you had these three states, different people make different observations, they share beliefs about these uh, three possibilities, and how do they? Uh, uh, why is it that you know clusters agree and then others don't? So we want to understand questions. This work. And of course, we're not the first to ask these questions. As I said, there, there's a large history. And if you look at the or through the history, as you know, I've done become a student of uh, this, you know, social sciences, economics, and sociology over the past uh, seven, eight years. Um, you see that there are two camps, two schools of thought in in understand I mean, trying to investigate these questions. One camp is, as you if you might think of it, is it comes from uh, decision theory. You know, it's mostly uh, microeconomics uh, and, and uh, operations research, and also signal processing and control. And the idea there is that you want to model not necessarily how people behave, but how rational decision makers should behave. And the fundamentals of decision making sort of postulate that. Rational decision makers update their beliefs according to Bayes' rule, uh, which we will review in a second. Um, then there is this other camp, which has sort of existed in the past, uh, even in the 60s and 70s in different communities, as we'll see you know, in philosophy, in political science, in statistics, but has become more and more uh, in, you know, prominent, especially because of the failures of you know, rational decision making models to predict. A lot of phenomena that we've seen over the past few years. Um, there is this other school of thought, which postulates that you know humans do not have the cognitive ability of, or the interest, neither the ability nor the interest, to uh, necessarily uh, rationally update their opinions. That they don't have; they're not machines that run Bayes' rule in their mind. Um, and so we need to have sort of behavioral uh, view of how or rules of thumb that are simple, uh, those better reflect how uh, people uh, exchange their opinions. And of course, a big challenge in this domain is that there's one way to be rational. There's infinitely many ways not to be rational. If you strictly interpret rationality as uh, uh, Bayesian uh, operating opinions. So uh, this, as I said, has been a, a big literature in uh, statistics, you know, and also it is a very a natural question to ask in many domains. You have uh, probabilistic opinions, you want to figure out how to fuse them. Uh, what is the right way of combining them together? Um, and like I said, you know, the axioms of decision theory were set by Savage in 1950s. That is the basis of modern and microeconomics. There is work of uh, Stone in early 60s, the Finetti was uh, uh, in 1970, the group who we will talk about more in detail, Common, one of the say, fathers of microeconomic theory from the uh, 70s, one of the Prize, and then a bunch of other works in, in different communities, including political science, philosophy, statistics, and so forth. And so the starting base of what I'm going to talk about is this model of the group, which is essentially uh, goes back to 1970s. It's the same model. As the Vicek model that I discussed earlier, except that there's no changing of graphs. So the idea described in this 1974 paper by De Groot is that if you have groups that want to make decisions and they have these probabilistic opinions that I think with 60% probability state one is correct, with 40% state two is correct, for example, the way to do this is one way to do this is that each node talks to their neighbors and then does a weighted average of opinions of others. 
And if you have a connected network, then you, as we will see, you converge to some uh, convex combination uh, of original repeats. And so we're going to study the effect of this. So this is what we call the consensus model or the Vicek model in the linearized Vicek model is, is really this um, uh, the root model. Um, now, the other camp basically postulates that if you're trying to figure out what the belief is on a particular state, then what you have to do is you have to um, basically use the phase rule uh, of probability. Uh, so if you're trying to see what is the, uh, should be your belief on a state theta given an observation S, then you look at your likelihood model, which is the likelihood of state S given theta times your belief on theta before times the total probability of, of this observation. So this is the Bayes rule of undergraduate probability that we, that we all study. And then so if you're a single agent and you have uncertainty about what state is true and you keep getting uh, independent observations, you could repeatedly apply the Bayes rule um, and, uh, and, and update beliefs. Um, so if I think about uh, let's go back to our example earlier of, of climate change. So recall that in the climate change scenario, we had three possible states. Climate change is real and man-made. It's fake. It's real but not man-made. So this theta would be a three-dimensional vector. And my new i, which is the belief of node i at time t on theta, would be a three-dimensional probability vector if some of these probabilities have to add up to one. And if different nodes at uh, different times make different observations, they deform these probabilities or update these probabilities according to the space rule. Each node has a mental model of how the observations they make relates to each of these states. And uh, if observations are IID, and if I'm one node, and if I get keep getting observations, then eventually I will figure out which one of these states is, is true. Um, under certain conditions. The beliefs will be martingales. You could think of them as type of Lyapunov like, functions. And, and uh, that, that works out fine. So we've known this since the work of uh, Blackwell and Silas and many others. So basically, you have a prior. You have a likelihood model. This is the probabilistic model. You have an observation. And you have the probability of observation. And this is the trick that allows you to uh, update. The question that many people have been asking, of course, is if you're doing this in a network setting, how would you do this? You're not one, not just one agent. And even if you go from one to two, then you get a lot of interesting um, uh, questions. A lot of work in decision theory in, in 1970s and 80s was just discussion of what happens when you have two. There's this famous result of agreeing to disagree by Amen from 1976 about this. So, just to make a long story short, and the details here are not important, very recently, joined with my student Amin Rahimian and my colleague Elhanan Mosel, we've actually shown that um, generalizing this to uh, a network setting, running basically this Bayesian updating in a network setting where the decision at every time you have a graph, you have private signals, uh, and you get access to your neighbor's beliefs over time, you want to compute the posterior at the next time. Um, in the worst case, as the network size grows, we show that this problem is empty hard. Um, meaning that there are graphs that can, that if you were able to solve these problems, then you can encode various hard problems that are, we know that are computationally hard to solve. In this case, the so-called subset sum problem, an exact cover problem. The details of these problems are not uh, important. It's just that these are well-known problems in the theoretical computer science and combinatorial optimization community that, that these are uh, you know, computationally hard, that there are likely no polynomial time algorithms that can solve these. And what we've shown is that you can construct signal structures and graphs uh, such that if you were able to compute this uh, Bayesian beliefs in a distributed way, you would be able to solve these hard problems. Um, and so um, we basically are, are saying that you know, doing not only this fully Bayesian updating 
is beyond the cognitive uh, limit of, of people, it's actually beyond any reasonable computational model for, for machines to. Of course, this is the very worst case. It's not, you know, a, a generic case. This, this might not actually come. So, given that this full Bayesian learning is intractable, what, what is it to be done? What, what should we do? How do we go? Well, people, are, in the end, people do something. Uh, how can we understand what it is that they do and what it works and what it is? So, just a few words about why this is a hard problem, just to give you an intuition of, of what's going on here. So, the reason this is hard is the following. Um, imagine that we have an, we're, you know, a network of people here. Uh, we form a social network in this room, and we're trying to uh, uh, basically uh, make make a decision, say about the same example with three states. We all have different observations and experiences. Um, the key difficulty here is that we don't communicate the history of these observations, we just communicate our beliefs. Right. If I had a God's eye view of this room, and if I had access to everybody's observations, then I could run one big base rule that combines all these observations, and I'd be done, uh, and this problem would be easy. The difficulty in this problem is that I hear my neighbors or my social peers' beliefs, which are these probabilistic opinions, but those beliefs are formed from their private observations and from the beliefs of their neighbors. And the beliefs of the neighbors are again formed from their private observations and beliefs of their neighbors. So what you have to do as a fully Bayesian agent is every time the neighbors communicate their beliefs with you, you have to first maintain an entire history of everyone's beliefs. And then you would have to refute keep a list of all possible observations that any node can get. And then as you get these, as the neighbors report their beliefs to you, you have to cross out all the observations that are inconsistent with those beliefs. And sometimes this crossing out would require you to sort of go deep in the network and, and get uh, all these information to resolve uh, uh, the And the big thing that goes on here uh, is, as I said, say here, to disentangle the influence of neighbors' beliefs and their uh, uh, private signals. And in particular, um, the issue here is that you want to remove the redundancy in, in the data. So the difficulty is that, is that the beliefs that other people tell you might uh, be correlated by similar information that comes from further hops away that you don't have access to. And that's what the source of the difficulty. So given this difficulty, what is there to be done? Let's go back to this non, uh, the uh, earlier work on this uh, non-Bayesian type work. Uh, the work by De Groot, this is now called the De Groot opinion model or the consensus model, basically says at time zero people have these probabilistic opinions xi to time zero. And then they average these probabilistic opinions. Um, if you've taken a course on a Markov chains or in linear algebra of non-negative matrices, you know that if uh, the graph that represents these updated weights is, is a uh, strongly connected graph um, that has self-loops, then you would get a uh, stochastic, uh, this updating would be a, uh, uh, basically an irreducible and aperiodic uh, stochastic matrix, meaning that the stochastic means that the row sums out of one. Um, and then eventually what happens is that um, the uh, rep repetition of uh, this for a long time results in a fixed point, which gives you uh, a weighted combination of the initial opinions. And the weights in that weighted combination are what we call this vector W1, are the top left eigenvector of this matrix T corresponding to the eigenvalue 1. Uh, we call that the Perron vector, or if you think of this as a Markov chain, that's the stationary distribution. In sociology literature, this vector is called the eigenvector centrality of this matrix because it 
the coefficient for each entry for each node of the network represents their influence. So you see right away what's wrong, uh, why this update is not rational. In the end, the consensus view, so everyone reaches consensus in this network, but the consensus view is a weighted com combination of the original opinions. Okay, that's fine. But um, these original opinions are basically weighed not according to how informative they are, but they're weighed according to how influential the nodes are, right? So these uh, W1i reflect the influence of node i in the network. If I have many neighbors, then I get more say. And that's because this update suffers from this redundancy neglect, right? I don't account for double counting or the so-called data incest problem, right? Um, I, and so the only measure of influence is uh, how many people I have to spread my rumor or my information to, and that gets uh, uh, sort of captured. Now, it turns out there's the results in the economics literature that show um, that this could still be okay if the network size grows to infinity and these influences are not too concentrated. And what that means is that as the network size grows, uh, the influence of every node decays, right? So recall that this vector is a probability vector, so all the entries have to add up to one, right? So as the network size grows, there are different ways that these influences can change depending on the structure of the graph. For some graphs, some nodes could remain uh, very influential. For example, if the graph is a star, Right? The center node of a star always remains influential no matter how, how many spikes you add to the network. And in such a network, if as n goes to infinity, um, law of large number does not kick in. So you don't get the so-called wisdom of practice. But if you have a balanced graph where the degrees of every node is the same, and then you let the network go to infinity. For example, if your network is a large ring or, a, or an infinite lattice, then law of large numbers kicks in as n goes to infinity, and, and then you'll be, uh, you'll be fine. Um, so to sort of um, deal with this, uh, and this is sort of, if you look at this paper by Golub and Jackson, two economists, they, they detail this. What we've tried to do is, is sort of come up with a model that resolves some of these issues. So a few years ago, we came up with a model. And also, we wanted a model that doesn't just take one observation at time zero, but allows for more observations coming over time. So we came up with this idea of non-Bayesian social learning that tries to combine these two things together. And so one idea was the following. The hard part of the Bayesian updating was including the beliefs of neighbors. The part that was easy was including your own private observations. So we said the following. Why don't I just remain Bayesian with respect to the private observation that I receive and then run this the group or the consensus averaging update after that? So first I ignore that I have a neighbor. I start from my prior belief. I get my observation. I run the Bayes rule as if I have no neighbors. That gives me uh, an interim belief which we call with that BU stands for Bayesian Updating. Um, so this would be the belief that I get uh, just without my neighbors. And then I average that with the belief of, of my neighbors. But then we thought, okay, so we, we developed a result for this and we showed that under similar conditions that I showed, I think, so, um, I, I would also uh, converge to, um, uh, to the truth as if I had access to all central information, centralized information. So uh, even though I'm not fully Bayesian, the fact that I'm not Bayesian with respect to my neighbor's beliefs, it doesn't really. And then when we were playing with this, we realized that instead of averaging, I could average the logs or take the geometric mean instead of the arithmetic mean of the 
and this would still work. So that might us wonder, what is, because we don't exactly know what rules to use, what is the family of updates that we can use and still have this work? So we came up with this, um, a general family, and we said, why don't I not worry about what the typical form of this update is, and I just use um, a family of functions. And these, this could be a very large family. Um, any function that takes the history of beliefs of myself and my neighbors for each node, and this could be time varying and change over time, and this function would give us an interim belief with, with the neighbors, and then once I compute this interim belief, I run the base rule with my observation. So the question we asked, uh, in, which is summarized in this paper, was uh, what properties should this function have? So I'm going to briefly go over them. Don't worry too much about the details. I will say these in, in words and I can share the paper. The properties that we had for this F, the first one was what we call label neutrality. What this says is that if you reorder the labeling of the states and then you aggregate them, that should not matter. So the aggregation operator and this permuting of the order of the states, these two should commute. The second rule, basically, is the property that uh, the base rule uh, for single agents. This basically says if I'm updating my opinions on one particular state theta, I should not care about my neighbor's beliefs on other states, the complements of theta. So if I condition on a subset and then aggregate the uh, with, with this aggregation function, should be the same as aggregating, uh, conditioning first and aggregating, or aggregating and permissioning. And the third was that this belief should be monotonic with respect to the beliefs of neighbors, this aggregation function. And all of these, one way or the other, are satisfied by a Bayesian update. The major departure that we had, which we thought would remove the cognitive burden of Bayesian updating, is that we ignore the history. So this aggregation function does not include the past beliefs of everyone that I've seen for all times. It only includes the last thing that they tell us. And we showed that by uh, only making these assumptions about the structure, the only function that actually satisfies the structure is, is the log function. So the log function that we intuitively guessed wasn't actually way off. Um, the only function that satisfies these axioms uh, is, is the log, and we could allow for time varying weights, and that gives us this type of update on any pair of states which says you take the log belief ratio uh, of uh, log likelihood ratios, and then you take some linear combinations of, of weights. So the question is, what conditions should these AIJ satisfy? And that got us to, into studying this group polarization in uh, social psychology. So group polarization is the tendency to make decisions uh, in groups that are more extreme than initial inclinations. Um, and there are two prevailing uh, explanations for that. One basically says you try to distinguish yourself from other members in the group, so you try to become more extreme than you originally were thinking about. Uh, so examples of this is, you know, if you get a bunch of people who think smoking is bad, after they discuss with each other, they all agree that smoking should be banned. So they become more extreme than, than what they thought of. Or if you take a group of people that are high prejudice, uh, then eventually, you know, after a while, they're uh, opinions become more prejudiced, or if they're less prejudiced, their opinion becomes less prejudiced after, after this. So uh, it turns out that you can map this to the properties of this A matrix, uh, this network matrix where AIJs show the weight that each node puts on the belief of others. We say these opinions or uh, belief profiles are group polarizing if the top eigenvalue of this non-negative matrix A, the spectral radius, is greater than 1. It's depolarizing if it's less than 1, and non-polarizing if the spectral radius is, is equal to 1. And our result says that the only way that you can actually, in such a model that ignores the history, that you can get learning is if opinions are non-polarized, if the spectral radius of this matrix is exactly 1. And the reason is that if the spectral radius is too much greater than 1, you amplify misinformation. If it's less than one, you will lose good information and you neglect it over time. And so we've done some generalizations of this, but it looks like I'm 
uh, running out of time. So let me just say one more thing. Um, so a special case of the spectral radius being equal to 1 is allowing for the weights to add up to 1. So if the row sums of this matrix is equal to 1, then the spectral radius will also be 1 because the matrix norm is an upper bound on the spectral radius. Or if you use any nonlinear rule, um, you could think of that, that, you know, if all the beliefs are the same, then I would believe, the, you know, um, the vector of ones is sort of the fixed point of, of this. And the question that you want, we wanted to ask is, what if these weights change over time, um, but I don't have a uniform uh, minimum for all these weights? So if you look at all the results in consensus with changing networks, they all make this assumption that the weights are either zero and then there's a uniformly positive weight. And we didn't want to make that assumption. So when you don't have these assumptions, then the weights might decay to zero. And so the question here is how fast the weights can decay to zero without uh, actually you losing all these properties. And we show that if the weights do not decay faster than one over t over time, and then the ratio of the weights doesn't become uh, too uh, influential or less influential. Then, uh, then the results will still work. And let me just uh, I want to talk about a few other things. I think I'm running out of time, right? So let me just stop here, and I'd uh, be happy to discuss this in more detail. Thank you. The requirement that the network is strongly connected is actually quite a strong requirement. And the reason you don't get full consensus in real society is that you have clusters. Social networks have created bubbles, so you have sub-networks, uh, and you have islands of people whose opinions are not shared from outside. So people who watch Fox News, they keep using Fox News. They don't care about where the real information is coming from. Um, so that's one. Okay. The other is that um, the, what our result shows is that the weights have to be just right for learning to occur. So if you think about it, you know, about all this possible set of weights, it's only a set of measure zero of them that, that are conducive to consensus. Now on the other hand, the flip side is we're saying there's a family of rules that can be used. They don't have to be linear averaging, they don't have to be log. Um, basically, we show that any positive homogeneous of degree one function uh, with uh, a certain amount of curvature would work. And we show that this result is tight. So we have a result that says if this homogeneity of, is of any degree greater than or less than one, then learning will not work. If uh, the curvature of this function is too high or too low, also it doesn't work. And so there are these other nonlinear uh, updates that could work. Yes. I mean, is that the right, maybe one way to understand the reason that it's hard is maybe because it has that model actually has an ability to kind of uh, have mental steady state or that's not the. No, that's the reason it's NP hard is that there are cases in which to remove the redundancy in data would require you to do complicated. Uh, you know, simulate those problems. Will you get different, different convergence points? You can get, like I said, we are restricting the behavior of this aggregation function, uh, and we're saying when you get one steady state. But there are other, there are indeed other. If you violate these properties, you might get other steady states. You might not even converge and oscillate forever. We've sort of characterized those as well. Thank you for your very interesting talk on the NP, particularly on the NP dynamics. I'm just thinking about this uh, issue that says when you create a network, you know, the normal opinion dynamics that really depends on all the different things out there, your know, threshold 
Yes. So, um, so I, here I want to distinguish between uh, the way we model phenomena in engineering and the way we model the phenomena in social science. In engineering, uh, you know, say in control, we have the physics of the underlying vehicles. So the more complicated we make the model, we get closer to the true physics of the model. In social sciences, the models are oftentimes mental exercises that are meant to accentuate a particular property. In this case, our model is meant to accentuate the behavior of this aggregation room and the effect of ignoring of the history. So it's a caricature or a cartoon as opposed to something that matches uh, the exact formulation. So in that sense, the more complicated you make the model, the harder it is to identify anything, right? Um, you might, you know, there's this agent-based modeling that is quite popular in, in some uh, social sciences, especially in political science. But if I have gazillion parameters that I put in there and I am able to produce some phenomena, there's no way for me to figure out whether I'm overfitting or not. So we wanted to come up with a principled parsimonious model that is axiomatic so that you can test the axioms in that sort of uh, thing. Um, if you have bias noise, you do. Yes. Um, so, right. So, when you have, so what you're saying is, um, so here, the noise that we have. So you're saying if there were noises in the opinions. Right. So if, if they are, okay. So if they're sending opinions that are biased towards one state. Um, right. Uh, this would, as long as they are, they also take, opinions from others. So the way you're describing it is you're violating the strong connectivity because you have one node that is giving something but is not taking it. Yes. Right. Okay. So you're so you want to add a bias to um, to all opinions. I believe the the Bayesian part of the update will cancel that bias but I haven't analyzed that. That's one difference between the fact. So this model is more rational. Even though it's not fully rational, um, it's more rational than the, um, than the consensus. Yes. Well, I would ask. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.